This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero safely on your iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source, and you always control your own keys and seed. And by XMR.to. Anonymously exchange your Monero into Bitcoin and seamlessly send Monero to any Bitcoin address. Go to XMR.to or use it right in your Cake Wallet. Cake Wallet and XMR.to are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman interviews Francisco Cabañas, a.k.a. Arctic Mine. For those of you that are new to Monero, Francisco is the man. He is a Monero core team member that has been actively researching and investing in cryptocurrencies since 2011. He holds a PhD in physics and is an expert in the field of cryptocurrency scaling, specifically Monero's elegant dynamic block size architecture. He is also at the forefront of understanding how regulators will likely deal with crypto. Douglas gets Francisco's opinion on Monero's all-time high transaction volume and how Monero is built to scale, the U.S. Treasury's proposed crypto regulations, and the delisting of Monero and recent node attacks. They also discuss the exciting upcoming Monero improvements like increased ring size and whether the mainstream's recent witnessing of how big tech can censor a president and political groups will help people realize the importance of censorship-resistant digital cash. Monero Talk starts now. All right, Francisco, thanks for coming on. Thank you. 2021. Um, how are you feeling about Monero these days? What, what's your uh, your quick take on Monero? Uh, right now, uh, it's under attack, but apart from that, it's doing really well. Uh, I think uh, one of the major threats that Monero faces right now is attacks by certain companies that want to engage in blockchain surveillance. I mean, we saw a major drop in the price as a result of delisting. So that's the negative, but overall, other than that, it's a phenomenally strong. Everything is okay. really strong. Yeah, I want, I want to go through a few things with you. Um, sure. Uh, you know, the, the growth of the network, which we're seeing, I think, through data of uh, increased transaction volume, mm -hmm. uh, uh, regulations, right? We're seeing uh, a, lot, a lot of activity there. Um, uh, the delisting, uh, the network attacks like you're talking about. And uh, what else? And I'd also like to talk to you about just this idea of the mainstream, I think, be, becoming more aware of the importance of censorship resistant technologies. So okay. uh, if you want to if you want to kick it off, we could talk about the increased adoption we're seeing. Is there is there real strong data there that's showing increased usage of Monero? Yes, there is. And in fact, if you look at the data over a two to three year period, you really get the trend. Now, there's a fair amount of fluctuation. Um, but if you look at the trend, yes, definitely there is uh, increased adoption. And I suspect increased retail adoption that is going on the network. That is very clear uh, if you look at the trends. The one of the difficulties with, of course, with a, uh, an encrypted network, which what we have, everything is that it's sometimes hard to tell what's going on. But if you look at longer term trends, we'll get we, uh, I get the picture. Now, related to that, of course, I, as you know, I work a lot on the scaling side of Monero. Uh, I've been working on an issue called Issue Seventy and MRL, which was looking at how the Monero network would respond to a crisis, which at the time, this was just before COVID, it was very similar to COVID. And what happens if you suddenly have uh, a sudden drop in activity and how you would do that and how it would respond and protect itself against that. And uh, part of the ideas that I pretty well got a finalized proposal for that uh, involves um, effectively using the long-term median as the penalty free zone from a technical perspective, but if, so you don't get a wild fluctuation in fees if, for example, network activity suddenly drops by a factor of 20 because of an external event, i.e. a virus epidemic. And uh, interestingly enough, um, what we saw during the attacks is at one point it was a drop of about 65% in network activity through frustration of the nodes. So this kind of thing would ensure that once you, you know, the community responds to the attack, 
then you don't create a long-term problem. You got to rebuild the long-term medium, the short-term medium back up again. Mm. Okay. Okay. So this was a technical issue that we identified. It's not a problem now because we're not outside of the penalty free zone. So mm -hmm. there was some, so it's, an, and it's sort of an urgent, but something that needs to be addressed. And because essentially right now, I mean, if you drop the network activity in Monero by a factor of F10, fees don't change because we're still in the penalty free zone. But if, let's say we were at a uh, hundred times the penalty free zone and you drop the activity by a factor of say 50, then you would have a sharp increase in fees in the recovery phase. And not only that, it could potentially take like a year or longer or even longer than that uh, for a factor of 50 at the current, for it to recover back up again. Oh, so wow. the, yeah, so this is an important subtleties in the long-term medium. That, and this is what I've been working on and, and that pretty much have a, uh, uh, pretty close to getting a proposal out on this. Okay, that that uh, that's not something I was even aware of. Uh, that that's a very interesting uh, concept. So you're you're working on that now, and you're gonna come up with yes, it's uh, pretty well done. I'm expecting it to have it really out fairly soon. Um, okay. yeah, the uh, basic principle is that we have to stabilize the the fall of the long term medium, uh, and also we have to stabilize the to prevent the fees from collapsing. And we have effectively to use the long-term medium as a penalty free zone. And that would address the problem effectively. So then you don't see a sudden drop like that. Okay. Uh, with, with this, just so I can understand better and the people that are tuning in, uh, with the increased volume, transaction volume, volume we're seeing now, uh, are, are, we, are we seeing dynamic block size in action? No, not yet. Uh, we are well below that. We're about a third of the um, dynamic block size, when even at the peak. Uh, so we're significantly below the dynamic block size. That's why this hasn't been an issue. At gotcha. This point in time. That, and that's what you mean by that. That's yeah, not, yeah, okay. that's the thing. But if we okay. go into say, let's say a hundred times our existing uh, transaction volume, that's when this issue that was raised in issue seventy in MRL becomes really a problem. I understand. I understand. Okay, that that's important. So we we could be approaching that that pretty soon. I would expect oh, within the next year. All right. Um, and you know, one criticism that we always hear, uh, you know, it, from the crypto community regarding Monero is the fact that it has dynamic blocks uh, and that it could lead to large or big blocks uh, that could lead to issues with being able to run nodes, uh, being able to propagate through the network. Uh, just for anybody who's listening now, I know we, we've talked about this in the past, but what is your response there to people that are critical of Monero and critical of the fact that it could lead to large blocks that could lead to essentially centralization of nodes because you know it's going to take uh, a lot of memory to, to, run, to run a node at that point? Okay. I'm going to pick... My example response to this is, of course, Nielsen's law. Now, Nielsen's law addresses bandwidth. And bandwidth would be the strongest limiting factor that a home user, a small business user would have, the home enthusiast. You have a lot more control about your CPU power, but you're limited with how much bandwidth you're the best plan you can get into your home. It is double, It has increased by a factor of 50% um, compounded pretty well since the 80s. To put this into perspective, if I was to have a one mega, a one mega uh, byte block in 2010, when um, the uh, one megabyte block size was introduced into Bitcoin, that would be equivalent today. It's actually more than that. It would be equivalent, say, in um, August of last year to about 57 megabytes today. So this is the kind of numbers we're talking about. We have to bear in mind that technology has not remained static and it's not remaining static. So this is the argument. You have a gradual increase, you're going to meet match technology. And the reason I picked the 10-year period is because that's the length of the block size debate in Bitcoin. So whilst everybody's arguing this very point, the goalposts are moving. And they're still arguing and the goalposts will continue moving. So yes, in principle, if you really started to push it in an insane level, uh, it could happen. But another 50-fold increase, and we're talking Visa transaction rates. 
So this is not, you know, something that isn't happening. If you really want to go back in history, you can go back to the original credit cards when they came out in uh, 1949, or because first uh, issued in 1950. And take a look at technological change since then. Monero scale is way better today than Dynas Club did in 1950, or even Visa did in 1960. In terms, well, of, actually, in terms, in terms of the, terms of the rate of, yeah. of technological advancement keeping up with the rate of increased adoption. Absolutely. I mean, if you look at early, uh, well, when I'm saying Visa, I'm talking the precursors to Visa, which would be Bank America. Uh, and, and then and then followed by Barclay Card in, in the United Kingdom. Uh, then they became Visa. But this is what I'm saying. It's if you look at the history of adoption of technology, yes, at the early points, the 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 growth, it, you know, you might not be able to sustain it with that technology, but then as you grow, the protocol has to support it. And that's the key point about Monero. When you really get down to is there a limit, there is, of course, and uh, the, the article a lot of people have, which has been dismissed a lot as Peter Rizzons, and he's one of the Bitcoin Cash uh, supporters, actually. And he claims that you would have a dynamic feedback, uh, effectively an extra penalty term due to uh, orphan blocks. We're nowhere close to this right now, but that will create a natural limit in that miners would have to in uh, increase their fees in order to compensate for the probability of orphan blocks. But we're not even close to this. And, and, the, and the dynamic nature of, of the block size accounts for that. There's a price to increase the monero blockchain. You can't just go and blindly spam it, even as it is, and, and, and that's kept in balance. So, no, I would argue that uh, gradual growth uh, is definitely very sustainable because of ongoing fall in technology in, in, in it. And, again, I go back to it. Here's the people in the Bitcoin community. They've been debating this for 10 years. The goalposts have moved already. Right, 10 right. years from now. We're already seeing it happen that that yes. technology is advancing at at the pace of of adoption. Um, I know I know I've asked some of these questions in the past, but I'm asking them because I you know I think we have a lot of new people that are looking at oh, Monero, of course, absolutely like concerns that are coming up uh, as as you know people make that natural progression from Bitcoin or wherever into Monero. These are the questions they have. Um, what so another one that I think I've asked in the past. What would Monero look like? Or would Monero be capable today of of handling the transaction volume that Bitcoin is currently handling? Easily. Um, and again, in some cases, it'll be easier to run a Monero node than a Bitcoin node. And one of the problems with the Bitcoin network, as it stands right now, is it's very vulnerable to spam attacks where you flood the network with transactions that are not going to be mined. I mean, I run Bitcoin nodes. So I see this myself. My bandwidth suddenly shoots up like crazy. It's not because there's more transactions in actually being mined. It's because all the the the, the they call it the memory pool in Bitcoin, which we call it the transaction pool, is being flooded with all these spam transactions. And and one of the reasons they do that is because there's certain dynamics where it's cost effective for a miner to spam the blockchain in order to cause fees to go up. And that actually is a major problem for the node. So you can actually have a major sizable rise in bandwidth of a Bitcoin node without mining those transactions. So in many respects, it'd be easier. So yes, no problem at all. I don't see that being an issue at all. What would Min Monero transaction fees and transactions per second look like if we had the current adoption that Bitcoin has? Transaction fees would well. What, see, the question is in terms of Monero or in terms in of terms US of Monero. You know, if theoretically uh, the the user base that Bitcoin has was ported over to Monero, uh, what would that look like today in terms of transaction fees? Okay. In terms of transactions per second. Transaction fee. The minimum transaction fee. The limit is basically falls as the square of the block size. So transactions fees will go down. Actually, the this is the other dynamic that's important. Now, when you see that what's in the Bitcoin network, it's a subtlety here and a very important subtlety. There's a lot of activity on the Bitcoin network right now that's going on on centralized ledgers of the major exchanges. And I did a study on this. I looked at this issue. And if you look at uh, Metcalf, Metcalf's law, right? if you take a network and you look at the price of the network and it goes to, say, the square of the network, 
or maybe linear for, for the equation of exchange. Monero is about 1.69, I think, when I calculated it, over a five-year period. Bitcoin, if you take a period from 2010 to 2015, five-year period, you get roughly 1.5. That's the exponential growth rate. If you go from 2015 to 2020, the next five-year period, you got closer to uh, like a quarter, like, uh, an exponent of 4.4 or something like that. The reason what's happening is there's this huge growth in price and no increase in the, in the blockchain. This economic activity is actually being shifted on the centralized ledgers of major exchanges. So if you're going to get the same type of economic activity on the Monero blockchain, you chances are you're going to get significantly greater transaction activity on the chain itself because we would also be capturing that uh, Monero, that activity that is going off chain in Bitcoin, not in Lightning Network, not in Liquid, not in all these other things, but actually on the ledgers of, uh, for example, Coinbase or Kraken, and some of the major exchanges where this is happening. And it's a subtle issue because uh, the, well before the regulatory questions came in, uh, the, there was a response by um, Coinbase who were quite upset at the uh, Community Futures Trading Co Commission they suddenly said you have to settle on chain. And they said, we couldn't do this. And the reason they couldn't do it is because their volume was greater than the capacity that the, the, the Bitcoin blockchain could handle. So we've got to be a bit careful here what we're talking about because there's a lot of economic activity off chain. Yeah, I, I, you touched a lot of things there. And so anybody who's just learning about Monero, it's yeah, really this, important to I know. And, and understand because... Uh, I mean, just just that 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 fact that you know the fees will essentially go down as the network grows. I yes. mean, that's that's something that is beautiful about Monero. It really is built to scale. And mm -hmm. you know, there's been if you're if you're often in Bitcoin world, you're kind of seeing uh, the opposite argument. People believe that Monero, for some reason, is less scalable because it, it, it deals with privacy and it has this extra load of dealing with privacy. You know, the transactions are essentially heavier. Uh, but as the, the system as a whole is built better for, for scaling. Is that, is that fair? That to is say? correct, yes. And now that if you actually were to compare a transaction in Monero or a transaction in Bitcoin, right now it's going to be over five to six times bigger in, in, in transaction size. But keep in mind there's also you've already built in the privacy. There's a lot of stuff going on in the Bitcoin network that aims to engage in privacy. Many of you start using coin joints, mixers, all this other stuff. That's just going to push that lower also. So it's mm -hmm. a bit a misnomer that you're not factoring privacy. The key point, though, is that the fees go down. And they go down basically in terms of Monero at the minimum fee. It can go down as far as the square of the block size. So it actually falls with the square of the block size. And, and the reason for this is because of the way the penalty function works. If you want to have a minimally mineable fee that will actually expand the block size, it goes down as a square. And what happens is that if the price in terms of US, let's say in terms of constant value USD of Monero, it stays within, it doesn't grow faster than a quartic, that's so the square. So this is going to something. Then, of course, you have essentially a constant fee in, in say, constant U.S. dollars, like, like say, 220, 21 U.S. dollars. You know, the Federal Reserve can't print in the future, basically. But that's the key point. So, so if we maintain that, uh, that the, the fee grows in that reasonable range, which is what pretty much most of the other cryptocurrencies, except for Bitcoin, is because it's been artificially constrained. If the fee, if the value uh, grows within that, then you will get essentially constant fees in terms of USD. Now, there is a one-term reduction that we will see. There was a couple of factors. First of all, once we, until we get to scaling, of course, until we get to block size scaling, we're not going to see any, uh, a decrease in fees because that's set by, the, by that, number one. And as you hit that point, the what we now call the low fees is basically not going to happen because you can't scale. So you have to go to the normal fee. And this is somewhat counterbalanced with the fact that we're going down to tail emission. So this is this, this sort of initial condition situation. But once you get into the scaling mode above uh, 300,000 bytes, then it's just basically the, low, the, the minimum fee will, uh, uh, can fall as low as the um, square of the block size, the inverse square of the block size. When do you estimate that we'll start to see dynamic block size in action? 
I think it's quite possible within the next 12 months. But a lot depends on adoption or whatever. But looking at the trends, I think it's very possible within the next 12 months. Okay. And just your, your thought uh, before we leave this topic with transactions, do you, do you think this is actual organic uh, usage we're seeing, real organic growth and usage, or is this potentially spamming of the network? Uh, what, do you, what do you see as being potentially the cause of increase in transactions? I, I see straight organic usage. Uh, the trends, it's just too long. It's been going on for too long. Uh, spam, it's very hard. You've got to simulate the entire demo. You can't just spam. You've you, got to create signatures, and you're going to identify that. And this looks very much like the actual network. But you've got to look at the long-term trend. It, it basically is following a long-term trend that's been going on for two to three years. We've seen organic growth in Monero even during the bear market and overall in crypto. And I think that's one of the factors. I could, I would say, however, there are factors that could cause a sudden surge in, 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 in activity in the Monero network. Um, so we could see a sharp rise. Uh, and that's the cons uh, sort of considerations that I'm looking at when I'm looking at the scaling formula also because, you know, the, the dynamic, the long-term median has to be able to, to keep up with that, for example. Um, but as it stands right now, uh, the trend is organic growth. It's not something else. So, uh, you know, you're definitely an expert in the field of, uh, you know, Monero scalability and understanding the architecture of Monero. But you're actually also very well versed in the regulatory aspects. Uh, I, I remember when I was talking to you quite some time ago, you had brought up concepts of the travel rule. And this is before people were even really talking about it at all and how it would start to play a role in the crypto space. Um, so, you know, I think you're very well worse, versed on regular, um, what's going on in the regulatory world. What is your take on the, on the rules that are currently being proposed by the Treasury? What's your stance there? What's your take? How, do, how are you currently seeing uh, the regulatory landscape for cryptocurrency? Okay, the first thing that's happened here, I mean, we did a, a submission. I was part of the Monetary Policy Work Group. Uh, we made actually a submission in response to that rule change by FinCEN. Uh, and quite a, uh, at odds with the majority of the industry, we actually are supportive of it with certain caveats. Uh, fundamentally, it's a sound rule, although their method was just the way they put it together and everything with respect to the timelines, etc., were awful. But when you get down to the nitty gritty of what they were proposing, it actually made a lot of sense. Now, the other thing to bear in mind here is that there was legislative change by Congress impacting this very rule in the middle of the rulemaking process. Yeah, you want to you want to talk about that a little bit. What was the change that was made? The, the, the actual uh, proposed the change rate. that was made is they added to the definition of monetary instrument under the Bank Secrecy Act. Um, and what they added there was uh, substitutes for currency or currency substitutes, I think is the wording. And then expanded it to all the other instruments, things like checks and all the other stuff in the bearer monetary instrument definition under the Bank Secrecy Act. Now, substitutes for, for currency is a broader term that encompasses um, convertible uh, virtual currencies and also what they're called um, um, legal tethered digital assets. So that is encompassed in this. So effectively what they did, what Congress did, is they set the stage for this rule where the rulemaking process was in, 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 the, in, in the making. So you, you, you'll you see submissions where people are saying, wait a minute, FinCEN doesn't have the, uh, the, the secretary, basically doesn't have the authority to do this in the proposed rulemaking. And in the meantime, whilst the rulemaking is going in, in, in progress, Congress turns around and gives sec the secretary the authority to do this. Now, the essence of the rule, when you get down to what FinCEN is doing, is to treat a cryptocurrency like Monero or Bitcoin for that matter, the same as you would treat cash. And you have similar limits, you have similar requirements. And this is the key point. And then they make and then you make comparison with a series of instruments, which for somebody of my generation, I have some understanding of what they are. 
And we're talking about things like bearer checks. I don't know how many people in the Monero community understand what a bearer check is, or well, they've even even issued one. Traveler's checks. I've never used traveler's checks. My father did. I'm 63 years old. Um, bearer bonds. Checks that are written where you don't put the pay name in. You just, you just write the amount and pay the order, leave it black so anybody can fill it in. That's effectively a bearer check. Or a check that has been signed on the back by the payee endorsing it, but without putting any specification on the endorsement, again, creating a bearer check. Now, the reason this is highly relevant is because when you talk about a cryptocurrency, you're talking about Monero, you're talking Bitcoin, and you tell a, a bank, for example, an exchange, pay Monero to this person. What you actually are saying is, to this address, sorry, not to this person, to this address, Pay Monero to the holder of the private key of this address. It's a bearer check. Whoever holds the private key of that address receives the payment. So conceptually, it's, it's, it's basically identical to a bearer check. But we have an environment where the majority of the population, people under the age of, I say literally under the age of 60, have very little understanding of what a bearer check is. And so you have this very, um, this, this complete disconnect in the responses in many ways, because honestly, a lot of people, you know, if I, it's like, okay, this is something they don't have if you're 22 or something, but your parents didn't deal with either. Maybe your grandparents did, and for sure your great-grandparents did. And this is the mindset that we're dealing with. So when you read a lot of the responses, you gotta put it through this filter. I mean, I gotta sit back and think, my grandmother was rode in a stagecoach into city at the turn of the, uh, between the nine, around 1900 and was telling me what they were doing, how switching horses at a certain distance and all that. And this is about as relevant to them as this is to me. Yeah, they're they're trying to apply. Well, I mean, crypto is is this new animal, and they're trying to apply, apply you know, dinosaur regulations to. to they're not dinosaur regulations. That's the point. It's a new animal that behaves very much like right. it there, was there's in nineteen sixty. An, there's analogies that can be made to uh, existing ways that we transact. Yeah, but it's more. It's actually closer. Monero's way closer to the economy in nineteen fifty than in 2000. Right. And that's the point that- And, that, and, that, and that's, well, that's the problem. You know, they, they don't want us to go back to that 1950, right? They don't, they-, they... That's a, oh, No, no, I don't agree with that. They're basically saying we're gonna regulate it the same thing we regulated in 1970. Right, but it seems like they're trying to ratchet it up now and-, and No, they're not. They're not. That's the misconception. And a great example of the misconception, they're not trying to ratchet it up. They're paralleling it. So they're treating it the same way as you would treat cash or you would treat a bearer check. Well, even with cash, the even with that, though, aren't we seeing some additional, uh, you know, with 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 the, the regulations as proposed, uh, aren't there different requirements compared to cash? Uh, you know, they want recording on any transaction over three thousand dollars, and with cash, uh, it's over what ten thousand. Uh, Aren't there differences there? There is a difference. There's one fundamental difference, and it relates to the treatment of the bearer check. Okay. And I'll tell you what it is. If I tell a bank to pay you Monero, what I do? You give me an address on your what we call a self-hosted wallet. They call it unhosted wallet. And I instruct the bank to send Monero to that wallet. You actually get at the end it's equivalent to cash, not a bearer check. The difference is if I give you a bearer check, in order to get cash, you have to go to the bank and present it. Mm -hmm. And at that point, the bank can ask you for ID. Right. And they have to ask you for ID. In this case, because you're already getting the quote cash, they're asking for the information up front. And that's why it looks like a new regulation. But they're covering the subtle point of the bearer check. 
that when you cash a bearer check, if you take a, a check that's payable to you, even if it's not even a bearer check, you take it to a, a check cashing store, for example, they still ID you. They have to ID you. And if you take a, a bearer check payable to you, you still have to ID you. Well, if it's a bearer check, you hold it. They have to ID you. That's requirement is there. So what they're doing is to say, well, let's put the ID requirement at the, at the point of issuance to compensate for the fact that you're actually getting the cash and the second step isn't happening. And that's a key difference. The $3,000 is a very standard limit pretty well everywhere. I've seen it in, uh, in a lot of other places. Yeah, no, I know there's the 3000 limit and then the 10000 One they want uh, for recording purposes, right? Yes. Um, but moving, moving slightly beyond this, I mean, overall, um, this seems to have – would have a, a, a greater effect on – coins like bitcoin than monero absolutely and, 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 and monero and this is essentially i guess what you're what you're saying here because monero obviously is more like cash uh these regulations are essentially saying let's treat cryptocurrency like cash right and and that's what we're, we're arguing for right we if you're gonna right implement these regulations on top of you know for crypto we want you to do them in the same way you you would do it towards cash and if okay. that's the case uh, it's going to benefit Monero in that you'll be able to freely use and transact your Monero once you pull it off an exchange, right? And and you you have to declare where that Monero is going to. But after that point, it's it's cash. It's basically, basically cash. No longer followed. Whereas with Bitcoin, the trail would continue to follow you. So there's almost uh, a positive here. In terms of Monero versus Bitcoin, um, it's a couple of things uh, you touched on, and and there's some you, you touched it primarily on the privacy side of it, and not the scaling side. Now I'm going to give you a, a more interesting example. This is from the Square response, and the scenario that was described there is you have a mother, and she gives four thousand dollars in cash to her daughter, and the daughter deposits in the bank. Now, what happens if the daughter already has a good relationship with the bank? She just deposits the, 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 the money, and there's no requirement for the bank to ask the information about the mother. The equivalent transaction on the Monero or Bitcoin blockchain would be mother takes a $4,000 worth of Monero, transfers it to a self-hosted wallet by the daughter, i.e. the cash transaction, and then the daughter transfers the Monero to the bank. Or you do the same thing with Bitcoin. So there's two transactions on the blockchain. One of them a cash transaction between two um, self-custody wallets, the mother to the daughter, and one from the daughter to the bank. If you skip the first transaction, you make it equivalent to a different transaction. And that is the mother going to the bank and depositing the $4,000 in the daughter's account. And the bank has to ID the mother. And this is what people are glossing over and missing. These subtle points are very critical. That extra step is very important because the bank has already done the uh, anti-money laundering, anti-terrorist financing risk on the daughter. So they know the daughter is safe. They're trusting the daughter because they've already done their risk analysis on the daughter. They know nothing about the mother. So if the daughter is intermediating the transaction, that limits the risk to the bank. Hence, they don't need to ask where it came from because they already trust the daughter. But if the mother does it directly, they've got to figure out who the mother is. And that's the key point. Now, here's the interesting part. That extra transaction on the Bitcoin blockchain could attract a fee of $50 to $100, especially with this regulation in place. That same fee on the Monero blockchain is one cent. The cash is a risk of carrying it around and so on, but again, it's in the limit. So you have this dichotomy just on scaling alone that you're imposing this fee on the, on the Bitcoin network about $50 to $100 for that second transaction. No wonder they're, they're screaming bloody mother. And Monero is fine. It's just one cent. It's an extra transaction on the blockchain. So the scalability of Monero kicks in, even before the privacy issue kicks in. 
That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, mo- yeah, I was only uh, really looking at it from the the privacy perspective in that it's equivalent to cash, but there's a there's a whole scaling element as well. There's a huge scaling that will element. critically affect Bitcoin, whereas Monero will be fine. And it goes back to this issue that I'm saying that this is all this extra activity going on the Bitcoin network, which is on centralized ledgers because it can't happen on the on the main uh, blockchain. So, so you obviously get it. Uh, you know, I interpret it this way as well, and I wasn't even considering the scaling options. I was just more considering the privacy. Why isn't the market absorbing this and realizing these regulations seem inevitable? They're they're going to happen, uh, whether they happen now or some version in the future. Why is that not being understood by the crypto sphere and realizing that Bitcoin is going to be more negatively affected than Monero? Well, there are two problems. First of all, the, the first problem is that the regulators have been listening to these blockchain surveillance companies. And I'm talking that they call it chain analysis or KYT or whatever. And quite honestly, contrary to a lot of the opinions, even the Monero network, this stuff does not work even in Bitcoin. They've clouded the whole thing in a big way to push their essentially their, their product or their service, which has real serious flaws. And we, we, we sort of dealt with that in it. I mean, for example, I mean, you can structure a transactions, money laundering transactions in Bitcoin to frame totally innocent people for crimes they have nothing to do with. And all you have to do is if I pay you Bitcoin and you're a business, and let's say you're, that business is subject to an extortion attempt by a criminal organization or by criminals, etc., and you have them the private key in Bitcoin. There's been a transaction they can't even see on the analysis software. Now it looks like I actually paid the criminal. And then if they sell that private key to another criminal or to a terrorist, again off chain, it looks like I paid did whatever that criminal act is. So there's a real risk in, in this with the, with the chain analysis stuff that people don't even realize. So you have this failed system in there. And that's created that that narrative, the first narrative. The second narrative is that there's an incredible amount of denial in the Bitcoin community around scaling. This has been going on for a long time. You talk about scaling on, on our Bitcoin, you will be kicked off that subreddit in a flash. So this denial, incredible. And so this denial is hidden by doing it on the ledgers of exchanges and stuff like that. So they're hiding. Essentially, you have a bank that is masquerading as a cyberpunk. And now Vincent turns around and says, we're going to regulate you as a bank. Ah! Well, you're, a, you're not a cyberpunk, you're a bank. So we're going to regulate you like a bank. And that's part, a lot of what's going on in the industry. So you have all the industry players, people like, you know, some of the major exchanges. They're making money by running these centralized ledgers, by batching transactions on the blockchain, of Bitcoin blockchain to get more transactions into the limited block space. So your industry around this that has developed around this weakness in Bitcoin that now has been put in jeopardy. So, yeah. You, you made a comment on Reddit. You, put a, you made a post uh, regarding uh, chain analysis and how it's an arms race against privacy. And you said in the case of Monero, they know they have lost the technological arms race. So instead they wage a war on the regulatory front. The key point is to understand here to understand here is that in this war, governments and regulators are not the enemy. They instead have become the battlefield. What did you What did you mean by that? What I mean is that you have a series of um, uh, blockchain surveillance companies lobbying the regulators to essentially delist Monero indirectly or directly or the exchanges. And so a lot of people in, in the community, for example, I, I cited a post, uh, the Australian example, and the reaction of one of the members of the community was against the Australian government. And re- a very negative reaction against the, the Australian government. And I'm not trying to defend the Australian government and their politics, but that wasn't the issue. The issue is this company came in here, made a deal with key payment processors and banks who in turn pressured the, uh, the exchanges in Australia to delist Monero. 
So this didn't come from the government. This came from the chain analysis company. So the battlefield is the regulatory scheme. It's a really scheme, sorry. It's, it's the governments and the regulators. So FinCEN becomes the battlefield. The U.S. Treasury becomes the battlefield, not the adversary, the an enemy. It's people are fighting. There are people lobbying the U.S. Treasury. Elliptic says the, the rule is, is terrible. Uh, we're saying, no, 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 it's good. So what's happening? Where are we fighting? We're fighting in that in that environment. Mm -hmm. And this is the thing. It's very interesting. I had one of the moderators in our Monero ask me to put that as a separate post. Mm hmm um that you mentioned that yeah um yeah and this is obviously part of the reason why why i ran ran for congress you know i, I was running for other reasons as well but i i do see that as being you know obviously cypherpunks believe that you know you, you we can create technology uh that's essentially immune to regulations uh and you know i'm a big believer in that and i think monero is doing an amazing job at that but at the same time in the real world there, there is this ability of governments to implement regulations that no matter how uh, resistant your technology may be against other technologies, it could have a very real world effect on the usability of something if they regulate it very heavily. So how far do you think that war will go, that battle will go? Do you think we're going to see some extreme uh, steps or strides taken against cryptos like Monero on the regulatory front since we're they're realizing that they can't fight it on the technological front? Well, they're going to try. I mean, because a realistic bit of it, sometimes the regulation is favorable. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. I mean, I, I'm very much of the opinion that the actions of the U.S. Congress and the actions of FinCEN are actually very favorable to Monero, not negative. The current situation is way worse by several orders of magnitude. It is very negative to these blockchain surveillance companies. So they're fighting a, a battle against us, and they have to, because otherwise, if you think for a moment, what would happen to these companies if Monero became as dominant as Bitcoin? It's not going to put FinCEN out of business or the U.S. Treasury. They have already have essentially a set of rules or parallel cash to deal with the scenario. So they're not having a, they don't have a problem. Who loses? The loser is actually the, the, the surveillance companies because they don't have no market for their product or their service. So they're the ones that are really at, at risk here. So yeah, they're going to try and fight in that regulatory arena. So it's critical for people to do what you did. I, I applaud you know, people, you know, run for office um, because you're not fighting the government, you're fighting somebody else. Right. But let, let's be realistic here. You know, the chain analysis companies are basically controlled by the banks, right? That's where they're getting their funding, right? And the, it's the banks that want, that are fighting this battle to change the regulatory framework, correct? Nope. I mean, it's, it's, well, it's, it's, it's the, um, the existing power structure, the, 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 the people and the corporations that are benefiting most from the non-crypto version of the world that have the incentive to go out and try to over-regulate something like Monero uh, and potentially treat it uh, maybe even differently than cash, right? To, to not allow it to function as cash. But yes, I mean, I agree that, for example, if you're a payment processor like Visa, you would have a you be very threatened by by not just by Monero but by cash. I'm not convinced that a bank is threatened by Monero. Uh, banks, as a rule of thumb, tend to basically make the money up of the very wealthy, uh, not the average person. Um, the nature of banking is an industry where you you basically make this the cost of each servicing a customer is essentially the same, but the profit opportunity is proportional to the customer's income and net worth. So uh, there's sort of a certain threshold. Banks really don't make money on, on, on customers, and that's why they don't, they don't like poor people, to be blunt. I mean, that's the mathematics of the whole thing. So yes, a payment process, a visa has been fighting cash head on worldwide. I mean, that's no, no, no secret. And they would have a major problem with Monero for exactly the same reason. It's a major competitor to them. I'm not sure that a bank per se, they can make, they have a lot of opportunities. Banks were not out of business in the 1950s and the 90s, they did really well. But they were servicing the very wealthy and the high-end 
uh, very wealthy individuals. They're making a lot of money doing that. So they have a lot of opportunity there. But a payment process is, yes, I would agree. In this particular situation, I think it's actually the people that are selling the technology that, that are really the driving force behind the scenes because they've managed to get the ears of both the banks and the exchanges and the regulators. And this is why it's so critical that we go out and say this is another aspect here. I mean, FinCEN, if you actually read in the very careful, in there, they say very clearly this is not a panacea. They see serious problems with what they've been told. Travel rule, great example. They've been dragging, the industry has been dragging their feet on travel, travel rule big time because it doesn't jive this mindset of, of doing blockchain surveillance. It's got nothing to do. You could do travel route just as well on Monero as you can on Bitcoin. It's got nothing to do with the, web, with the underlying blockchain. But they're trying to say, no, no, we're going to give you this instead that the regulators don't want, which is the chain analysis or blockchain surveillance uh, um, narrative that they've been selling. So this is, and there's been a lot of resistance on travel rule in the industry, uh, primarily because it's not what they want to do. They want to do this other thing. So I see, I see it. Uh, so I think that distinction has to be, I think the banks, yes, they might be concerned about cryptocurrency. I don't think they're there yet. Um, I think the biggest threat would be to the credit card providers, the payment processors. They're the ones that really might feel threatened by it, as opposed to uh, an actual bank. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. But yeah, my, my point being that there, there are, there's, uh, you know, there's, there's those that, um, are benefiting from a from a non crypto wor world, and in particular a non Monero world, who have incentives to to try to thwart the progress of Monero. I think well, that's, that's fair to say. Well, absolutely, there. Yeah. But th there's a subtle difference here. There are those that are that want to thwart the the overall crypto. Mm -hmm. There are those who want to thwart Monero because Monero actually does what the original design of Bitcoin was designed to do. The, uh, the existing implementation of Bitcoin does not threaten payments at all. In fact, you know, all they're doing is they're replacing a Bitcoin denominated debit. They're using that to replace a, a USD denominated debit card. Well, it's the same thing. So they're not being, Bitcoin's not a threat because of what's it involved, because of its lack of scale. The only way it can be a threat is if people can actually use it. So, yes, Monero is a real threat in that, in that, in that, in that point of view, yes. And which which leads me to the next thing, which is the delistings that we saw, mm -hmm. right? Um, so that's a that's a reaction of that. Um, what what's your take on that? Um, Bitrex delisting, uh, they saw Monero potentially as a risk, and they no longer allowing trading of Monero. Do you think we're going to see more exchanges continue to do that this year? Uh, we had. You know the Perkins Coey paper that came out that seemed to make very cogent arguments as to why an exchange should be okay with uh, allowing Monero to be traded. Yet, you know, soon after that paper came out, we saw Bittrex dropping Monero. What do you see happening next in terms of exchanges? I think the recent changes that have been proposed by the by U.S. Congress and by FinCEN would put a damper on that delisting trend, uh, primarily because it's just following the narrative that uh, it is treated like cash. I also think a lot of the delistings are driven by two factors. First of all, I mean, take for example in Canada, and I'll give you two examples, There's two exchanges. One of them actually lists Monero, and they don't even have a Monero Bitcoin pair. They only list Monero CAD. And Monero um, USDC. And there's another exchange that lists Bitcoin and will not touch Monero. I, I, I'm a strong customer, I told them, and they won't touch it. Guess what? The second exchange got in real trouble with the Ontario Securities Commission because what they were doing was they were wash trading Bitcoin and they got caught. So a lot of this is a bunch of factors. They're, they may have a weak AML uh, and um, uh, risk management scenario in that exchange. This is actually very negative. Uh, that could be a factor. And yes, I think as a lot of the factor is those that, that want to push Monero out of the equation, uh, namely the, uh, the uh, blockchain surveillance companies. They definitely have I mean, an impact. In the case of Bittrex, I suspect they wanted to look good to a regulator, and that's an easy way to do it. 
Uh, it's not a, an objective risk analysis, but rather risk analysis theater. It looks good. I mean, they threw out Dash. Now, you can argue whatever you want to argue about Dash, but a lot of people in the Monero community would say that Dash doesn't have any privacy. They even they agree that, that they don't have any hardly any privacy. Yet private send, which is a seven-year-old coin join technology, is enough to break this blockchain surveillance, apparently. So there's a, there's a lot of theater around this, too. They want to give the appearance to the regulator if they got a shaky situation. I mean, that's the, that's my take. Is it going to continue? Well, one of the things we want to do in the, in the Monero uh, policy work group is to, is, is to put a stop to this and to get reach out to the regulators, to reach out to to the uh, – so that, no, this is not working. I think this is – I think the uh, – like I said, I still think the move by FinCEN in this direction has been very positive. Keep in mind that they already cast a doubt about blockchain surveillance in their own arguments for this rule. They said it's not a panacea, and they raised a bunch of questions. That opens the door for us to say, well, yeah, you're right, which is kind of, but it's actually a lot worse than you realize. But they opened that door. And, you know, obviously we need exchanges to list Monero. I mean, we really, we really don't at the end of the day, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's something that we want to have to, to allow people to continue to easily onboard to Monero uh, until we have things like atomic swaps and other ways of being able to go from Bitcoin to Monero. But overall, I mean, long term, I think it's fair to say these are bullish indicators or indications, right? When we're seeing the fact that it's proving that, like we said, that Monero is doing what Bitcoin originally intended to do. Uh, and that's why we're seeing these delistings. That's why we're seeing, uh, you know, these chain analysis companies trying to figure out, uh, you know, how to be essentially change regulations to deal with Monero since they can't deal with it on a technological level. And short term, it's scary, but lo long term, it's proving that Monero works as intended. Is that, well, is that fair to say? Yes, true. But first of all, I think uh, I, I would like of Vincent on this one. Uh, I don't see atomic swaps with Bitcoin as a panacea. Okay. Um, in fact, I will see atomic swaps the other way around. I will see it that we need to be getting strong fiat on ramps for Monero, make it the dominant on ramp for fiat, and that way actually provide more privacy to to coins that don't have the privacy strength that Monero does. So, atomic swaps of Bitcoin to Monero is interesting. Uh, you know, uh, I, I'm, you know, it's a, it's a great technology. There are a lot of risks with it, especially with all the surveillance on the Bitcoin side. I, the whole thing gives me the creeps. I mean, I, honestly, I, I don't know if I would want to sell Monero for Bitcoin and then be told my Bitcoin is quote dirty, unquote, by some proprietary algorithm. I'd rather sell my, if I want to sell Monero, I'd rather sell it directly for a fiat currency through a regulated exchange, um, that, you know, you do all the proper interface with the banking system. That makes that's what we need to be working on. You know, it's it's not that really wrong with it. I mean, it's fine. It's great technology uh, for small transactions, but that's not the answer. Um, and especially, and if you want to do a small scale, you want to be you know two meets two guy meets and then do it for five hundred dollars in cash for five hundred dollars with a Monero. I mean, that's fine too. But I don't know if we, we create this dependency on Bitcoin is the answer. So, no, I don't I don't see that as atomic swaps as a big answer here. Um, so we do need the, the on-ramp. We can't just say, well, Bitcoin is going to take care of it from us. So that, that, I don't think, is really an answer. We need to deal with the fiat on-ramp. We need to work with the regulators in this respect. So that's a critical. We can't, can't, we can't use Bitcoin to bypass it. That's my, my, my take on this. And quite honestly, I mean, for a small person, if you wanted to use a transfer coin, to go into Monero from say US dollar, something like Litecoin or Bitcoin Cash is way better choice than Bitcoin because you don't have those outrageous fees on the network. Even Ethereum, I mean, I sold a small amount of Ethereum and bought for Monero, it was a $4 fee for $100 worth of Ethereum. Just the Ethereum, just to sell the, pay for the gas to, to transfer it on the Ethereum network. 
That yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I can't agree with you more. I mean, I would, I would love for a world where I can easily transact Monero uh, between Monero and Cash. I mean, that that's that's the dream. Um, unfortunately, it feels like there's going to be kind of a dark period there where that's not going to be the case. Where it's going to be difficult for that to happen. I mean, we're we're, we're going through it right now. Okay, the reality in Canada today is if I wanted to sell Monero for Bitcoin, I have first to sell for Canadian dollars and then sell the Canadian dollars for Bitcoin. There's no direct Monero Bitcoin pair. In so Canada. that's already in yeah. Canada right okay. now. So either you go off trial somewhere else, or if I go to the Canadian exchange that trades Monero, the pairs they list is CAD, and USDC, they don't list Bitcoin. Why is that? Why is that happening in Canada? I would ask to ask them. I think it has to do with a couple of things. First of all, I can see why the regulatory risk could be higher for a Monero card pair because the, sorry for a Monero Bitcoin pair. Because if you've got dirty Bitcoin, what better way to get to, to sell it than for Monero? So I can, I can see that sort of uh, they want to sort of probably separate it out. Um, and maybe I think the, the, the way they're structured, um, the way they do business, they may see this more liquidity directly that way. Uh, but that's how they're structured. They do a same with all the other coins. But uh, yeah, so that's the reality. So so my reality is somewhat closer to my to, to the ideal in that respect. Mm. You know, it's diff it's interesting. If I want to sell through another exchange in Canada for Bitcoin, I got to go through a foreign exchange, not one in not one in Canada. Oh, wow. Okay. Let let let's move on, and I th I think I'm yes. gonna make this a, a two part video because yes. this is this is getting long, but this is good stuff, and I I want to ask you a few oh, more questions. Oh, oh sure. The network attacks that we're recently seeing. Mm -hmm. Um, what what's your opinion there? Um, are you do you have any concerns, or you think this is uh just growing pains? People are paying more attention to Monero. Uh, and it's it's just becoming a target. What, what's your feel on the on the network tax? I guess what happened there. I mean, I, I I put my faith. One of the things I say about the network, of course, is every single element of the Monero community. There's some things I don't have a, a really strong grip on, and this is one of them. I put my faith in the professionals who are dealing with it on our end, to be honest. Um, but uh, my take on this, it is a the, 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 it hardens Monero. They found a vulnerability that was that could do this. Uh, and then it was responded to. It is part of the process. I mean, that you could do this this this, this kind of stuff. Um, and it, it, I don't see it. I mean, there was a dynamic response, a very good community response. It dealt with it. My focus has been primarily on the scaling side. I mean, okay, what happens if this happens in this other scenario and they trigger this thing? I'm going to deal with that. I can figure out what, what it took, how long it took the community to respond and then figure out, okay, well, we're going to make sure that, you know, nothing drastic happens in fees in that time frame. That would be sort of how I'm looking at it from my perspective. Mm -hmm. So how can I build on that to strengthen the, 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 the aspect of scaling? Because, okay, so it took the community about a couple of weeks to respond to this. We've got to make sure fees stay stable in that period of time. And that's kind of the, the, the answer that I've got to look at it. It's a strengthening part of the process. And Monero was attacked actually in 2014 quite early with a 51% attack. And uh, again, it just came out stronger out of this. And this is what's happened here. What could cause it? Uh, could it be a certain disgruntled individual? I don't want to mention but the hood stories it could be the person behind it. Yeah, we did a whole show with VT Nerd on it. Uh, uh, yes. Talking about fire ice potentially. Well, that's the the, the word. I mean, I that's the name that that was that that, that I was referring to, um, and basically, I mean, that could be a motivation. But what comes out of the process is a stronger shame. My perspective on the whole thing is: what can I do on the scaling and fee side to strengthen that side of it, so that if this happens again in a scenario, it doesn't trigger the fee collapse. Uh, and disruption in the sudden rise in fees in the time it takes to respond to it. So that's kind of my interest in it primarily. That's how I'm looking at it. Okay. 
How about the fact that there's so many new code releases that are coming out in in reaction to it? Are you concerned that you know they may, we may be moving too fast and you know no. we can break something? No, I'm not. I've also heard recent discussion uh, people talking about trying to uh, essentially um, review the entire Monero code. Obviously, it's been reviewed in many ways, but kind of do an official audit of the entire Monero code base. Do you mm -hmm. think that's something the Monero community should consider doing? Refactoring has been talked about since 2014, since we inherited the code from uh, uh, Bitcoin. Uh, and there's been an ongoing process. Um, and I think this is a continuation of that process. Uh, yes, this kind of stuff is actually very, very, very strength strong. Uh, the more you you look at code, the more you audit code, the more you refactor code, the stronger it gets. So this kind of stuff is very important. But this is not a new thing. This has been going, going on since the inception of Monero. Um, that I've heard that uh, that discussion for a long time already, and it's the kind of thing that we need to do. In my opinion, I mean, um, it's, it's it's part of maturity of the project um, that needs to happen. So yes, I've heard the, as to the comments on that. And you think we'll finally see that happen in in a very real way, where you know money funds are put towards audit. Well, funds are already been put towards auditing in specific situations, and. And there's been refactoring going on in the Monero code for quite a while already. This is not something that is new. Yeah, I know they've done it in parts and pieces, but uh, kind of a holistic. Uh, yeah, so so this kind of thing is is uh, is a solid uh, um, thing that's going to happen. Whether it's going to be done in one big chunk or it's going to be done over time, that remains to be seen. But I, definitely, my opinion is something that needs to happen, and it's happening. All right. What what are you most excited about in Monero right now in terms of technological development that's coming down the pipe? I mean, there's a bias there because I'm working on one myself. So obviously, that's what I'm focused on, which is the fee stability issue that I'm working on with issue 70 and MRL. So that is my bias, personal biases, because that's what I'm familiar with. What I see happening in Monero that's exciting, to be honest, uh, is this slow progression of efficiency that we're seeing. And it's kind of like, in many ways, we're talking about a lot of small things. The whole is greater than some of its parts. So, for example, what we have seen since the advent of Bulletproof is a slow improvement in efficiency that has essentially dropped the transaction size from about 2,600 bytes to about, well, now we could go down to about 18 something. And we're going to invest some of this back very likely in the form of uh, increasing the ring size. The big ones that are coming down the pipeline, of course, is Actorius and Triptech. Now, Triptech is, um, the difference between there is that there's um, a proof that uh, Saran Notha did on Actorius which I think requires, it's just so cutting edge that you have to find the people that can actually audit this thing and, and really understand it properly. Uh, he feels very comfortable about it, but that's maybe take a bit of time for that because of that. Trip tech, of course, what allows you to do is to keep um, transaction size small and significantly increase the ring size. So that is a major breakthrough. The limiting factor is likely to be a verification time um, there. But again, I'm of the opinion that it is bandwidth as the limiting factor as opposed to verification time. So because of the uh, um, limiting factor for, for the enthusiast. So that's coming down the pipeline. That's very exciting. Uh, but it's, it's more, I think, a cumulative effect of a lot of minor improvements, really. That's what's going on in Monero right now. How about the near-term increase in ring size uh, that is being proposed mm -hmm. and talked about before TripTech is added? Um, I'm of the opinion that I'm probably my feeling is it should be a bit higher than they're talking about. I don't know. If, I don't have a problem going to 17. My my thoughts is it should be somewhere between 19 and 25, somewhere around 21, 23. 
uh, mainly because that's closer to where the transaction size will match that of Triptech. And also you, you want to uh, have a slower shock to uh, from a verification time to, to the network when Triptech comes online. Um, it's, it's again, one incremental improvement to like, uh, of what I'm saying. When would we likely see that? Well, if it happens, it's likely going to happen at the same time as the uh, Bulletproof Plus fork. And that's essentially in the audit process right now. So very likely the next hard fork. I, I suspect that the outcome of that discussion is going to happen uh, in that time frame. All right, that's so, exciting. that's exciting. Yeah, so that's what we're going to be looking. But again, if you look at what's happened in the last two years, we have a series of incremental improvements, each one of which hasn't really done that much, but the cumulative effect has been very, very positive. Last, last question, last topic. Sure. Um, so we're, we're seeing in very real ways the importance of cens censorship resistant technology, mm -hmm. distributed technologies. You know, we had we had a president in the United States that was basically deplatformed from, you know, Facebook and Twitter. We have Parler, uh, which is the alternative to, to Twitter, supposedly the more censorship resistant version uh that that's been booted off amazon web services so we're seeing this ability of corporations to use their power and influence to essentially dictate uh you know conversations and control groups and censor information and we're seeing it in a more real way than we've ever seen before do you think this will be the moment where people start to really wake up especially here in the West, in America, wake up to these facts and then make that jump and realize, oh, okay, there's also, this is also potentially could happen in the world of finance and money where, you know, my bank, bank account can be closed, where my transactions can be censored. Could this be the awakening that brings people to something like Monero? I actually, it's a very interesting point. The deplatforming of President Trump, where he's still a sitting president of the United States, regardless of how you feel about the man, that is a wake up call to everybody on this. Um, I've heard comments from places like France and Germany. They're saying, wait a minute, this is not something that a corporation should do. It's regardless of how you feel about them and what the justification is, that's a wake up call. That's a real wake up call, in my opinion. Um, yes, I think that's going to open a lot of people's eyes because the power of these corporations is insane. Um, I don't, I don't, I'm not on Facebook and I'm not actually on Twitter. Uh, I, I might go on Twitter, so I might be convinced I'm not ever going to go on Facebook. Um, and that's a really interesting point. But the, the, the but it's not just that. I mean, I, I mean, it's the power of companies like Microsoft that controls operating systems. Um, Apple with their censored uh, store. I mean, that's. I mean, I don't know if you recall when Apple censored Bitcoin. Up yes. to 2014. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, seriously. I mean, you buy a Bitcoin for like a cent, and then you sell it for four hundred dollars when or five hundred dollars. And Apple gave the their users permission. I want to use the derogatory term, but um, you, you get what I'm getting at here. I mean, and then you buy Monero with the proceeds. <laughs> but I mean, you know, this this stuff is a real threat. Um, uh, and I think it's a wake-up call. And I think, yes, the deplatforming of, of Trump is a, is a real wake-up call. Yeah, because all too often you hear in crypto land, uh, you know, you hear a lot of people that say, well, you know what? People just really don't care about privacy enough for Monero to have relevance. And I, I see it, you know, there's there's a, a litany of arguments to make against that. But if you just focus in on that point that that that's basically made that people don't care enough about privacy, I think events like this could start to turn that tide where people who formerly have not cared enough about privacy that were willing to use Facebook, uh, give up their privacy for, for the purposes of using a free technology, 
that they these, think event, these events are going to be that wake up call that makes them realize that privacy is important and it can start to affect their lives in very real ways. It's not just privacy, it's censorship, which is a different issue entirely. I mean, because Twitter, for example, is not a, a, a platform you would go there for privacy. Yeah, well, I, I see those it's, things it's, as intertwined, right? So the, yeah. the, the privacy that that Monero offers essentially is also what allows it to be so censorship resistant. Yes, right? yes, yes. That's that's very true in, in, in financial transactions. But but Twitter is essentially a broadcast medium. Mm -hmm. um, and Facebook is a different story because Facebook creates fake privacy. And that's why I really have a real problem with that. But there's a wake-up call about this co corporate control. Uh, and, and that, I think, is a real wake-up call. It will have an impact. I mean, there is trends. Right now in Canada, there is a Digital uh, Rights Act that is in the process of going through Parliament and being looked at already. We've seen the moves in the European Union. We've seen the moves in California, for example. So there's a real awakening of the whole privacy question, digital rights in a broad sense, not just in the specific situation here. So yes, Monero fundamentally is sitting there. The question is, when is it going to wake up? Right. It's, it's not a question of it. It's, it's if, it's when. And the when is a really important question. Um, I, I kind of take. I I I stop trying to predict when Monero is going to wake up. I just sit on it and do my part and be. Uh, well, sooner or later. But if you try to ask you to predict when, I have no idea. Yeah, and I mean, uh, in, in reality, what we're up against too is the fact that Bitcoin's number keeps going up, and you know you have people that are very heavily invested in that. So you even see the talking heads like Andreas Antonopoulos, who's tweeting about, you know, that you should move from WhatsApp to Signal if you're concerned about your privacy and that, you know, it's it's tracking and tracing everybody. Uh, so remove it from your phones. Yet he, you know, is hesitant about pointing out the flaws that Bitcoin has in terms of people's privacy. And huge, but it's not just privacy. I mean, it's also uh, scaling. And um, but basically, Andreas, I think is is in a very delicate situation. We have essentially a bubble in Bitcoin, one that I, in my opinion, is not justifiable uh, on a host of levels. Because if you look at Monero, Monero has addressed three things that failures of Bitcoin. It's not just it's privacy, yes. It's scaling, and it's decentralization with random X. I mean, these are critical issues. I mean, Bitcoin is effectively controlled by the Chinese government through mining. Yeah, no, I, I obviously agree with you on all these points. And uh, I think yeah, so it's a, it's Monero, a really... Monero is the best hedge against Bitcoin if you're gonna if you're gonna look uh, at those terms. Personally, I don't hold any Bitcoin. I've used it as a transfer of coin. Either do I. Um, and I hedge it with I hedge my Monero portfolio with other things, everything from real estate to gold. But but that's another story. But you know, I, it's not. Uh, Bitcoin has become a bubble. It's lost its purpose. And in many respects, I hate to, to quote what's his name, uh, uh, Warren Buffett, when it's rat poison squared. Well, maybe this he's got the exponent wrong, but I... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I... I don't know what to say about, about this, but Bitcoin has lost its purpose because once you take away the transactional currency, what's the point of it? Yeah, so, it's, yeah, it's seemingly been co-opted. I feel like it's yes. the, the, the greed was the engine that got Bitcoin as far as it's gotten in terms of growing its network effect. And it's it's it was built that way to run off that engine of greed. But I feel like it, that greed has also taken it to a place where it's sold out a little bit in terms of the features it needs to offer for it to live up to the original vision of what cryptocurrency is supposed to be. I see a great vision in Bitcoin and very poor engineering. And I think that's really what it comes down to. And it's not something you can, what Monero has done is taken the Bitcoin vision and engineered it properly. That's a good way of putting it. Well, we'll leave it at that. Francisco, uh, yes. This was a great Thank conversation. You. We're probably going to put, split it up in, in two parts. Mm-hmm. I always ask my guests at the end, where can people learn more about you? Obviously, I think most people know about you already, but like I said, I think 
fortunately, there's a lot of new people getting into Monero these days. So yes. where, can more pe where can people learn more about you and follow you? And Sounds great. And, uh, so wh where is it? Where I, I know you're not on Twitter. I know where, where can people uh, see um, your writings and your thoughts? Primarily right now, I'm on, I'm on Reddit. Um, and of course, uh, that's primarily why I'm involved right now as far as social media. Uh, I do have occasionally posted also on Bitcoin Doc, but not recently, but that's primarily where I am right now. And of course, mine on Reddit, correct? That's correct, yeah, and, and without the C. So, yeah, and uh, um, so that's where you'll see me right now the most. Uh, and, of course, things like what we did uh, for the FinCEN uh, thing and so on. I can be reached through my Arctic mine at uh, getmonero.org if you want to reach me by email. I mean, that's also there. Um, but that's the main places. Of course, I hang out a lot on IRC uh, within the community. So that's where a lot of I interact with most of the members of the community actually is on IRC. So those are the, the main channels. All right. Thank you so much, Francisco. Thank you. All right. Hope to check in soon. Okay. All right. Thank bye. you. Bye. bye. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have an Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Monero Talk podcast. Go to monerotalk.live slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.